2004. And this is the beginning of an interview with William L. Bates, Jr. at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Bates is... How old are you? 82. 82 years old, having been born on March 8, 1921. My name is Lynn Lowence, and I'll be the interviewer. Mr. Bates, could you state for the recording what war and branch of the services you were in, your rank, and where you served? It's a long history. I was in World War II. I enlisted as a private first class in 1942 and <clears throat> uh, stayed in the Marine Corps until July 1965. Uh, and I was in World War II um, and the Korean War. The uh, places where I served are numerous, of course, and I can uh, get to them uh, later on as, 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 we, uh, as we pass through this interview. Okay. Could you tell me a little bit about your early life? Where you were born <coughs> I was born in Columbia, South Carolina, and my parents moved to Atlanta uh, when I was just a, an infant. And I grew up in Atlanta. We uh, lived in Ansley Park, and uh, I went to 10th Street School. We lived on Jennifer Street for a while, and I went to 10th Street School, and then um, then O'Keefe Junior High, and then Boys High School, and then Emory University. And then I went to the University of Pennsylvania to do graduate work. Um, and I was, uh, it was a, a, a scholarship and an insurance given by the Hebner Foundation. Um, and I was there in, in uh, Philadelphia when World War II broke out. And Were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I was still just 20 years old, uh, so I had not, I was not subject to the draft when, and when the war broke out. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I came back to Atlanta and tried to uh, get in the Army Air Corps because I had a, a pilot's license. Um, but <clears throat> the Army said I couldn't... Uh, I had some problems with my eyes, so I tried the Navy, and they said I had problems with my eyes. And then this friend of mine from the Marine Corps came by, Jack McLaughlin, a fellow from Savannah. He said the Marine Corps didn't care whether I could see or not. <laughs> so I, could, I couldn't fly, but I <laughs> went ahead and joined the, joined the Corps. Shortly thereafter, I went to uh, Quantico for officer training, and uh, while there, uh, I was offered and accepted a regular commission in the Marine Corps. Uh, I, I stayed at Quantico in the, in the schools there uh, as a, an officer instructor for <coughs> some time, and then then went to sea school and then went to the USS Lexington. No, first I went to the USS General William Mitchell, uh, a, pers a, a, a transport where I had a small detachment of, I think, uh, uh, it was myself and 28 men. Tell me about your, your boot camp and training experiences. What was that like? Well, of course, the we had some of the finest NCOs in the world as our instructors and, and very competent officers as well. Do you remember any of their names? Oh, um, it was a, Felix Daniel was a gunner sergeant, a, f a fellow by the name of Adam Midas was one of our sergeants. Uh, Villarreal was another one. Um, Eubanks was a platoon leader. Stout was a platoon leader. Um, what makes him stand out in your mind? 
<coughs> you know, it's hard to say. Probably the fact that they were, they had such complete integrity as individuals. They uh, they were, were all very hard on us uh, physically and, and mentally, uh, but only to to toughen us, I think. And it uh, it was a very rewarding experience uh, because you really did leave behind uh, civilian practices and come into a different culture, which is what the whole thing is about. What would a typical day have been like? Well, we'd get up, <coughs> I think, probably about 5 o'clock, then go out for the morning run, which was generally a couple miles, and then then uh, come in for breakfast. Then uh, then we would have classes in uh, various military subjects uh, all throughout the day, and then secure at night around I guess 5:30 or 6, and. Uh, have supper and go to bed. <laughs> so you said you went on from there to, what was the first ship you were on? It was the General William Mitchell, <coughs> AP-114. Uh, it was a, a troop ship. It was one of a class of ships that were built. This particular ship was, was uh, manned by the Coast Guard had a marine detachment, had a small army uh, troop detachment on it, Navy doctors, Navy chaplain. It was a, if, uh, everything except the U.S. Air Force, and that hadn't been invented then. How many people? Hmm? How many people would you say were on the ship? Uh, ship's complement, <coughs> probably a couple hundred. But it would carry 3,000 troops, and it was fast, uh, so it, it uh, usually, almost always, traveled alone, um, depending on good in, good information and speed, and uh, to keep it out of of the way of submarines. We <coughs> traveled a couple times to Casablanca, and then uh, a, a couple of times to one time to uh, to Ireland, then a couple times into um, Liverpool. Uh, then we came back to Norfolk and <coughs> went through the canal uh, out to Melbourne and then to Bombay. Then came back and picked up a bunch of Marines at Pavuvu, including General Ray Davis, who recently died in the Medal of Honor winner. Um, a, a wonderful man um, and first rate a Marine. And came on back to the States, and I was transferred from the Mitchell to the, uh, the Lexington, which is a CV-16, an aircraft carrier, one of that, uh, at that time, they were the largest carriers that we had. Had a 104 planes on board. I had a Marine detachment of myself, two officers, and about 60 men. Um, and we, um, I joined the ship in, um, in a Weetok which is a atoll out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we we went into the Philippines for a little bit, then uh, went up and um, participated in some raids against the Japanese homeland. Do you remember when this was? Well, this would have been in late 44, probably. Uh, or maybe mid-44, and then we came back to the States to get some repairs done, went, went back out. 
um, I forgot which trip we we participated in the uh, attack on Iwo Jima. Um, Could you tell me something about that? Describe that. Well, I was not ashore. I was on the ship, so you know, I I, I don't really know anything about the the physical attack on the land. Did you we, see no, no. The, the carriers stand out to sea. Uh, they need room to launch and, and recover planes. And, um, they, they don't, and generally, uh, you don't see much land if you're on an aircraft carrier, unless you're a pilot. But then uh, we. Um, Came back to Seattle, uh, Puget Sound, for a refitting, and back out, more raids, and then the then the war ended. Uh, we <laughs> I remember that uh, we ju had just gotten the word that that the armistice was being signed, and then. Uh, we heard over the speaker system that there were some bogeys coming in, and uh, Halsey was was aboard, and he he said he said are they are they bogeys? And they, the answer was yes, sir. And he said, well, shoot them down, but do it in a friendly fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and did you? Yes. Uh, uh, then we steamed into Tokyo Bay and into Yokosuka Naval Base and landed. Uh, they made up a fleet marine regiment uh, made up of, of men, officers and men from the ship's detachments and went ashore to uh, se uh, secure the naval base and the naval air station, which they had there. Uh, and we were ashore for for several days. When we came back to the ship, they wouldn't let us uh, anywhere beyond the gangway because all of us <laughs> were ridden with lice. So they had rigged a fumigation tent, and we got a got on the ship. <laughs> went in this fumigation that killed all the lice before they let us <laughs> let us back aboard. Did you have much contact with the Japanese when you were off the ship? No, not much. I, um, they were very peace, peaceable. We, I went with a, a, a bunch of fellows in a jeep and the jeep broke down near nightfall, and I sent the others back, and one man stayed with me, not really knowing what was happening. It was got cold, and so we went knocking on a couple doors, and this Japanese uh, invited us in and gave us some tea, and we were waiting for uh, hopefully some somebody to come out and rescue the jeep and us. And this, well, this tough-looking Jap walked in, you know, and he looked at us, and I thought, uh, I think maybe we got some little trouble brewing here. And then he said, uh, either one of you from Chicago? <laughs> he said, I've been, I've been in this place now for three years, and I want to go home. <laughs> He had um, he had come over. No, it was longer than three years. He had come over to get his fiancee, and they uh, the war broke out, and they kept him. So, um, but after the Lexington, um, I went to troop training unit Atlantic Fleet, and. Uh, was there for a while, then about a year, I guess. And then I was sent over to 
headquarters U.S. European Command, uh, which at that time was in Frankfurt on Main, supposed to be getting ready to move to to London, which never happened. Uh, I mean, we were there for about 18 months, and then we moved to the headquarters. Moved <coughs> to uh, Saint Germain en Laye, a little town near Versailles, just outside of Paris. And what year was this? That would have been in 1950. How did no, you decide? not no, 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 no. 1950 was the Korean War. Um, Oh, I, I left out the Korean War. How could I do that? <laughs> when I when I came came back from the Lexington, I took command of a Marine barracks at Solomon's Island, Maryland, and then shortly thereafter took command of a Marine barracks at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, where the blimps fly, and. Uh, got interested early in the helicopters because there was a Navy experimental helicopter squadron there uh, and they had some Marines attached to that squadron and the Marine pilots were attached to me. I made several very good friends in Rinko Aviation at that time. At any point, had you thought about leaving the military after World War II? No, I... I uh, I loved the Marine Corps. I loved it from the moment they offered me a regular commission. I, I was sold, and I never changed. Haven't changed yet. <laughs> Don't think I will now. Uh, but to to resume from um, the Marine barracks at at um, Lakehurst, went to the junior school and uh, at Quantico, and from there went to the Second Marine Division, where I uh, was put in charge of a, an outfit that was to develop uh, basic infantry skills and you, some people who would, who uh, had just graduated from from uh, boot camp. It was called the USMCV program, and, and it later became the individual combat training that the Marine Corps used, and still uses. Uh, and then, then um, I became staff secretary of the division. Then went into the. Uh, 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines uh, as weapons company commander. Shortly thereafter, the, the whole, most of the division got on trains and went out to the West Coast and 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines became 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. And um, I st still was weapons company commander. We were out on the West Coast for just a couple of weeks and then loaded in the USS Noble, uh, an APA, and which is an attack transport. Uh, and we sailed to Kobe. When we were at Kobe, we had to, it was real interesting, everything was done in such a terrible hurry that we we had a mixture of loads in, 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 in an amphibious operation. You've got to load the ship in a very special way because if you want ammunition, you can't go digging up from the bottom of the hold. The ammunition got to be up here. But so has medical supplies and so has water. You know, so it is combat loaded and with some due attention to what the shoreline is like and, and what your needs will be. This ship had 
had left in such a hurry they didn't have time to do that. So it was commercial loaded. That is, everything went in. Well, when we got to Kobe, we had, a, I think, about a, a week there, and we had to unload the ship and then reload it, combat loaded. And it was complicated by the fact that, that a, a, a big storm came up during that time. Everything got wet and, and blown around. It was really sort of a mess. My, my dad was in, in uh, Tokyo and, and my mother. And they came down to see me during that time. My father was a colonel in the army, right, and he was in MacArthur's headquarters there. Well, I'm a junior, so he was William Leroy Bates. When I, in the pictures, you know, when I was talking, I, uh, I should have mentioned that there was this picture. This is the way that I, I looked as a young, fresh-caught Marine. And I've got another picture here that showed what the years did to me. <laughs> when I retired, I was a little older. But <laughs> you had two pictures with your father. You? Yeah, I'll, and I'll bring those, okay. get to those in a minute. Um, we we then sailed for. Um, uh, Korea and made the Incheon landing and uh, it was uh, it was really interesting because the landing was made primarily at night uh, oh gosh a good friend of mine landed on Wolmi Do which is a little island and stuck out in the middle of the harbor during the day uh, I can't remember his name but <laughs> but then uh, our our regiment was due to land on the southern part of the beach. The whole thing was complicated by the fact that they have a terrible tide there, I think about 21 feet, and and the bottom is mud, so that if you get stuck in the mud, you're you're there. So you got to take advantage of of the tide at its height. Well, we, my battalion was to go in in reserve, and we would go in about 5:30, but we didn't get started until about six. And it was getting dark. We, <coughs> the the boat wave commander apparently didn't have good instructions because we went in. And I could see two islands on our right, and they should have been on our left. So I, I told him uh, to, to come about, because uh, I was in the fifth wave. Uh, the first waves went on in, and they were landed in the wrong place, landed in some salt pans, and had a terrible time. But we came out. And went around the, <laughs> the islands and found Blue Beach 3. And instead of being the fifth wave, we were the, not only the first wave, we were the only wave <laughs> for a while. But we ran into very minor resistance, you know, a couple of shots around. We had one guy who was hurt a little bit. Um, and then some other people came down. Then some of the people managed to work their way down the coast. And we were finally managed to get most of the battalion together. Uh, then we, <coughs> from there, we went on into the attack toward Yangdong Po, which is a town on the other side of the Han River from Seoul. Uh, and moved pretty rapidly there. We had a we had a wonderful bunch of of. Uh, people in our battalion. The uh, Able Company was commanded by uh, Bob Barrow, who later became Commandant of the Marine Corps. 
Becker Company was commanded by Wes Norin, uh, ended up a colonel. Um, Charlie Company was commanded by Bob Ray, uh, tall, thin drink of water. Uh, you know, it's funny. People always seem to think that the thing they do worst is the thing that they do best. Ray would always tell me that they were the most caught up, put together company in the world, that they always were on, not only on time, but ahead of schedule. They were never on time, they were always late. But, you know, you, you could point to the watch, and Ray wouldn't believe the watch. <laughs> good, good man, you know, first, first rate man. Um, my executive officer was a guy named McIntyre, who was a cold, stiff drink of water. Um, he, he was all right, but I was not particularly fond of, of him. Uh, I had a machine gun platoon leader named Bill Masterpool, who was absolutely fantastic. He just just first rate. He, and my mortar platoon leader was uh, Eugene Paradis, a Yankee, a Maine fellow. And, um, and, and, and brilliant. He, he devised a way to um, increase our mortar support. In a battalion at that time, and still pretty much so, uh, you have some internal fire support weapons. The companies have little mortars, 60 millimeter mortars. The battalion has 81 millimeter mortars, which has a range of about three miles. Uh, and it has six. The idea being two to support each rifle company. Well, Parity said, let's not do that. Let's steal two more mortars, which we did. And uh, we had, instead of having three sections of two mortars each, we had two platoons of four mortars each. And then the mortars then were able to displace one after the other. And Parity also said, let's don't fool around with the old fashioned way of calling fires, which was a forward observer would um, estimate the azimuth, the, 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 the line between the gun and the target. Let's say that the observer is here and the gun is here and the target's there. He would put an imaginary line here and when the gun fired, he would try to correct that fire based on the imaginary line. Well, they're pretty skillful. But Parity says, let's just go to the artillery way because isn't that complex? So the, the artillery way is that you have a line between you and the target, and the gun has a line between itself and the target. You tell the gun where the shot fired according to your line, and they use their tables to move it to their line. Well, it increases your effectiveness and speed of uh, tremendously, and this was Parody is doing. Um, Parody and Master Pooh were two of the finest young officers I'd ever seen. Both of them real short. Used to call them the Gold Dust Twins. <laughs> no, no, just just terrific. Then um, the AT platoon leader, anti tank platoon leader. We had 3.5 inch rockets and flamethrowers. The platoon leader was a guy by the name of Bill Coline, K-O-E-H-N-L-I-N-E, -E, a, a fine young officer. Um, the battalion commander was Jack Hawkins. And Jack Hawkins, he, he had been a fine commander. But I tell you, uh, he was captured by the Japanese on uh, Corregidor. And uh, it didn't break him, 
but it it caused him to become afraid of being captured again. I know that at one point Hawkins and I were going around in the in Seoul. We were trying to get around to uh, come up with some leading elements of, of the battalion, and a, a North Korean tank suddenly appeared behind us and started shooting at us, and we jumped over into some wrecked buildings, and Hawkins said, said I'm not going to be captured again. He says, if they come in here, won't you just shoot me? I said, I ain't going to shoot you. You shoot those bastards. <laughs> well, we, uh, the, the NK tank kept on going, thank goodness. We, we made it all right. But that, it, it happened, similar thing happened again in a little town called uh, Kojo up in North Korea. When, uh, but I'll come to that later. In Seoul, of course, our regimental commander was the legendary Louis Puller, Chesty Puller, five Navy crosses, a fantastic guy. L Louis Puller wanted to, me to be his operations officer. I didn't want to be Louis Puller's operations officer. As Wes Norton says, if you're Puller's operations officer, it's very simple. All you need is a ruler. We're here, they're there, draw a line. <laughs> it's pretty much that way. I know at one point, we were up, we had just taken this high hill overlooking Seoul and we were getting our uh, battalion to swing around the hill, which is a very difficult maneuver. Um, you know, we'd advance the company and send the company out and they would go around and we sent, uh, but just to, to make it a real swinging movement. We'd had a pretty hot fight the day before and pull all of a sudden appeared at the CP. And he'd look and there's nothing to be seen. You know, our, our troops are moving. And he said, what's going on? What's going on? He says, how many casualties have you had today? And Hawkins said, we haven't had any yet. And uh, Puller said, we ain't fighting then. You've got to have some blood out there on the street. <laughs> About that time, a tank came up and blasted with its flamethrower out and the building shut up in flames. And, People were running around screaming, hollering, a lot of shooting. And Paul said, well, now that's better. Fuller <laughs> was something. He, he uh, Fuller went to a great deal of trouble to make people think that he was all bluff and bluster. He's really a, a very intelligent guy. He, he, uh, he was... Uh, Marines, Marine, he was terrific. Well, he was the regimental commander. Uh, well, let's see. We went on in the Seoul, and um, um, took it. Then we, we uh, after that, we got into transports. My company was loaded into a uh, what they call a skajap. It was a, a um, an LST, which is a landing ship tank, which had been rented to the Japanese for, uh, to use the fishing boat. And uh, so they unrented them to use them f for invasion craft. Well, the, the Japanese had used this thing as a efficient boat and you could really tell it because it smelled a high heaven. <laughs> it was worse because when we we left Incheon and went around the end of the peninsula and on up to Wonsan. When, when we got up there we turned around came back out to sea and then we turned around and went back up. They were trying to clear mines out of Wonsan Harbor. And I think we were, it seemed like we were there for a month, but it, I guess we did this about three days, and then finally went ashore at one side, just an administrative landing. And we were sent down to Kojo to protect some supplies down there. Uh, we, 
there was a, a rock uh, Republic of Korea, South Korean uh, uh, regiment that was around this, this little beautiful little seaport town. Oh, just lovely. Well, we we no sooner got there than they hightailed it, and uh, we put out our dispositions, which were were far too separated, and we got hit by the 10th North Korean Regiment during the night and lost uh, lost some some people that we shouldn't have lost, you know, in my opinion. And then Hawkins got the wind up and wanted to go back to one side, and a couple of us said, no, we're not going to do that. Let's, let's don't do that. So he got on the radio and said we were in deep trouble. So they pull a sent of another battalion down for this big fight. Well, of course, the other battalion got there and nothing was happening. Sent a destroyer down for naval gunfire support. <coughs> and uh, then we then we were relieved and pulled out. And as soon as we got back to one son, Pullis sent Hawkins home. Gave us a guy named Buck Schmuck. Not a name. One of the finest combat men I have ever seen in my life. An arrogant, uh, egotistical, uh, you know, just, oh, just uh, awful. Except that the men loved him and so did the officers because he was just plain good and absolutely fearless. But, you know, <clears throat> When you're in combat, every once in a while you, you have a chance where you, you, you can have a fire and you stand around the fire and talk and and stuff. Well, schmuck. Now, and at those, that's time you're permitted to lie. Uh, you can you can say, no, I made all A's in college, and nobody will challenge that. But you're not permitted to lie too much. Schmuck lied too much. Told us he was an Olympic diver. That he had gone to participate in the games in Nuremberg. Was hailed by his old hometown just outside of Innsbruck when he stopped by for a little visit. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, they had a big ranch out in in uh, Buffalo, Montana, Wyoming. Well, the, the problem is all those things were true. <laughs> it's, it's, like I say, just absolutely fantastic. Well, we had we had some uh, small combat actions there. Uh, my dad visited us there, and that that's another picture that I've got. This little teeny one. Uh, my my dad would <coughs> would um, come over to Korea on business from MacArthur's headquarters, and he would go to the Army headquarters. And of course, by the, after his first visit, they knew immediately that to send a, after he did what he needed to do there to send him to Tenth Corps, and Tenth Corps would send him to the First Division. The First Division would send him to our battalion, and Dad would spend the, spend the night with us. He also generally would bring a, a couple bottles of whiskey, which <laughs> which made made him a very popular figure. Um, but it was it was. I remember one time, um, Dad got um, was up in in um, Hong not Hong Song up. Up in the port, Hung Nam, <coughs> and uh, they said they sent him down in a helicopter the next day. But choppers were all up north. We'd already started the push up toward the reservoir. Um, well, so, and, so um, I got the, a radio message 
And I thought, well, well hell, I'll just go get him. So we were about 20 miles south there, and I threw a couple of rifles in a Jeep. And my Jeep driver was somewhere. I, I couldn't locate him, and night was approaching. I wanted to get dead and get back because there were gorillas all through the area. So I raced up there and found Dad and, and got him in the car, checked him out in the rifle, and said, now look, there, there are some gorillas, but let's, let's go. I said, uh, we'll, we'll be able to make it back pretty much by nightfall. And um, Dad said, let's go. So we got in there. The only bad thing that happened was that we weren't attacked because <laughs> <laughs> Dad and I felt that there weren't, there was no force in the universe that could possibly uh, beat us. <laughs> we were damn fools! It was lucky <laughs> nobody <laughs> wiped out our face. Oh, but he was he was a, a great guy. Um, well, we then went on up uh, up toward the north. The division already had uh, had sent the fifth Marines were way up around New Dimne. All of this is around the Chosin Reservoir area. Uh, and these are high mountains. There are mountains up there around 5,000 feet, and it's, the terrain is very rugged. You know, it's it's not a nice, gentle mountain. It's chop. Um, the seventh Marines were. Uh, Hagariri and most of the first Marines were at Kotori and we were the tag in. We had been cleaning up some stuff in the south and we were the tag in and went up to a place called Chinhungni. Uh, we had some uh, probing attacks from the Chinese but we sent out some combat patrols and some fires and and um, pretty much pushed them away from us. Uh, by enlisting the, the civilian population, uh, you know, tell them if, if China stays in your house, we don't come and burn your house down. So before the China stays in your house, why don't you come tell us and we'll shoot the Chinaman so he can't stay in your house. A quid pro quo that uh, was pretty good. We, um, but then, then of course the, the, the Chinese came in with massive forces, and uh, the the division was was told to to uh, retreat. You know, O.P. Smith said, we ain't retreating, we're attacking in a different direction. Well, that's true that we were attacking because all of us were surrounded. You can walk any way you wanted to, you'd be in the attack. <laughs> but, um, when they did that, we figured that, that the one thing that we knew that we could do would be to attack north and take the big hills. There's a uh, there's there's a road, and the, you've got to use the road to get wounded out, et cetera. And the road is just a little, the road's no wider than, than these two tables. Um, and, you know, the drop-offs is a thousand feet here. It's uh, um, road's essential. Uh, and when the road came from Kotori out around this thing was a, a big mountain here, but a, a distance from the road, and we had uh, gone up there a couple of days before um, and registered artillery, uh, including some uh, stuff, I think, from the 9th 2nd Armored Field Artillery to this guy, Colonel Lavoie, an Army fellow, great guy had this uh, uh, eight-inch howitzer battalion. 
and then uh, 155s were there, and we had we had registered some good fires on. Sort of blown the Chinese off that hill, but we needed to go up and attack the the hill because the road came back and then made a deep switch in, and it um, and the, there was a bridge. The engineers had come up and repaired this bridge when Schmuck and I went up to make this reconnaissance. And, uh, and they, cleaned, they cleared out just as the Chinese were coming to, to collect uh, Buck and myself and the squad that we had with us. Uh, but we figured pretty certain that the Chinese weren't going to let that bridge stay, and they didn't. Um, and of course that was a choke point, but if we got up on the hill we could <coughs> protect the people working on that bridge so that they, they re, redid the bridge. They dropped bridge <coughs> um, uh, sections from, from aircraft and then muscled them into place <coughs> so that people could get past this. This bridge was at, at a Penstoke station. It, uh, the the Gen Reservoir and another reservoir fed in, into uh, uh, Penstokes, so big tubes that, using uh, the force of gravity to turn turbines to produce electricity. And that was, they was, that was still functioning. Um, and there was an inclined railroad. But at any rate, we, we went into the uh, uh, Schmuck and I had reconnoitered, the, reconnoitered this place along with Bruce Sigmund, the S2, a guy named Tobin, who was the uh, artillery forward observer, a couple, a few days before. So we had a good idea of the terrain. They went into the attack and uh, secured the hill, and then and then the um, people started, our, our, our men started coming out from Coterie, and Bob Taplett, I think, was a, Lieutenant Colonel Taplett was one of the first people that, that uh, <coughs> made contact with us. And the division, uh, it was cold. And I don't know whether you realize, it's hard to realize how cold cold really is. Now, we were up there, I think the temperature was <coughs> about 15 to 20 degrees below zero, and the wind was blowing, and with the wind chill it was about 45 below zero. Well, <coughs> when you're in the ground, you don't have any place of heat. Ground's cold, you're cold, everything's cold. And we had lots of troubles because our, our men had been issued these shoe packs which are designed to be waterproof. The problem is that when you walk in them, your feet sweat. And then when you stop, your feet freeze. So even in the attack, you've got to make your men stop, sit down, take off their, their shoes, socks, and the inner, inner felt, <coughs> and replace them with dry stuff, and then start in the attack again. Well, we had over 100 men who... Uh, were cold casualties, although every officer and NCO was trying to get people to uh, protect their ears and protect their feet and protect their hands. It was terrible. I see you looking at your watch. Are we running overtime? We're fine. We're ten okay. Am I rambling? Your details are marvelous. Unbelievable. Oh, good. Don't encourage me. I'm like, <laughs> well, we came down from from the um, uh, the mountain 
and <laughs> then we're brought back in a transport to um, uh, Maison, and there we were refitted with with equipment and uh, and uh, reinforced with with uh, replacements. While we were there, uh, I <laughs> I told Buck Schmuck, I said my my parents are in Tokyo and we aren't doing anything around here. I'd like to go over and see them. He says you have lost your mind. <laughs> I said <laughs> he said if you ask Puller to do something stupid like that, he'll eat you alive. I said, well, you know, right now I want to do that, and Puller doesn't know that I want to do that, and he won't ever know unless I tell him or unless you tell him. Spock said, I ain't going to tell him a damn thing. <laughs> he said, if, if you want to, be my guest. Good. So I went to Puller's tent. I, I knocked on the tent pole, and Puller looked up and said, what you want, Bridges? I said, sir, my name is Bates. I don't give a blankety-blank what your name is. What do you want? <laughs> I thought, well, this had started off wrong. <laughs> I will. So I said, I told him that my mother and dad were over <laughs> in Tokyo, and if I could get a ride over here, I'd keep touch through MacArthur's headquarters, and if the battalion was going to move, I'd be right back. He said, you'd Stupid, blankety, blank, blank, blank. And I thought, well, <laughs> there, there it goes. He said, he said, I, I don't understand. He said, how anybody, anybody, would be so blank, 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 stupid as to sit here at Christmas time when his mommy and his daddy are only ten, <laughs> a few miles away in Tokyo? I don't understand. He got on the field telephone, cranked it up, and said. Give me the general. OP, this is Louie. He, he says, I got this fellow here. I want to send him to Japan to see his mommy and his daddy. He says, his name is, is Bridges. I said, sir, my name is Bates. He says, I don't give a damn what your name is. <laughs> so, the, the next morning, I was on an airplane heading for Japan. And, uh, oh, I, I got over there and called. Uh, I called my parents and they they were not there and I called there was a Navy fellow named Bruce Adell captain and they were old time friends of ours and I called and talked to his yes, uh, his wife she said your mother and dad are at the the big Japanese hotel in Tokyo I can't think of the name of it right now he said, we're going to join him in a few minutes. Why don't you go there? And I said, I'll go there. So I had a Jeep and uh, went, found the manager and said, I'd, I'd like to get some of the smell off <laughs> if it's possible. <laughs> and uh, would you tell my dad that I'm here? Well, soon, shortly thereafter, dad came steaming down. So we had a big reunion and then went up and, so mother and I had a couple of days with them, then went on back to uh, the battalion. So we uh, shortly thereafter we went up uh, a little bit north of there to an area that the North Koreans were had infiltrated, and they were doing a lot of guerrilla attacks. We never could figure out quite why. We don't know whether they were cut off or what, but at any rate, they were. Raised in Cain with all the little communities around there. Bruce Sigmund set up his intelligence network. You know, he'd, he went to all the little villages because it was time to shift the rice. And he said, look, we'll, we'll protect you and your rice if you'll just keep us informed about these folks because if you don't, they'll come in and they're going to burn your rice. And so we started getting pretty good uh, info and we were chasing the guerrillas and pretty, chasing them pretty much out of the county, I guess. But then um, Ridgeway came, and the tempo of the war changed, and that was a good thing. And uh, we went up 
from this little area of Yuesong, Andong, to Wanju. I went up in an ambulance. I had been sick as a dog, and the, the battalion surgeon said uh, that I should go to the hospital ship. And I was uh, had pneumonia, and uh, Buck Schmuck said, said, he said, uh, he said, Bill, the, the surgeon says you ought to go to the hospital ship, and he said, I'm going to just leave it up to you. He says, we, you know, we need you. Um, because we're going to go into the attack, and we, we, we just need you. So you make the choice. And I said, I want to go to the hospital ship. He says, I'm God damned if you're going to go to the hospital ship. <laughs> we'll send you up in an ambulance. <laughs> so so <laughs> I a couple of days later, I got bundled up and slammed into the ambulance. And we went over the roads up to Wanju. And I think if there's been any day that I really th thought maybe I made a mistake, <laughs> it was the next day when we went into the attack because I, <laughs> I um, <laughs> put on put on my pack. It was raining, and we went slogging down through the blooming mud, and then got into a firefight and dig digging foxholes, and it kept raining and the foxholes kept filling up with water. I've never been <laughs> more miserable in my life. <laughs> but we had, we had some good days. Um, uh, a lot of maneuvering. We were on the right flank of the division most of the time, so we didn't have to worry about anybody on our right. We could make big developments. And, um, and you know, sometimes, and this sounds funny, but sometimes war can be right fun. Um, you know, the, the, you, 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 you're dealing with some Chinese who are retreating. So you, you attack at 8 o'clock in the morning. You have five minutes preparation, go into the attack. He shoots a little bit, and you shoot a little bit, and he retreats. And the next day you start at 8 o'clock in the morning, a little fire. And the next day you start at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the next day you send troops way out at 3 o'clock in the morning to come in and then you start to attack at 8 o'clock in the morning. The Chinese start running and you wipe out a, a company. <laughs> Just, <laughs> and, it, it, um, and it virtually no law, so it, it's, it's good. It, would, it isn't good, but it, at least it's entertaining, I guess. Ten more minutes. Well, I'll tell you about probably the most difficult battle that we were in. Um, when the Chinese started their spring offensive in um, April of 51, they broke the 6th Rock Division on the left flank of our division. And there was nothing between the Chinese and Pusan, period. No forces. Uh, there were large quantities of Chinamen who were coming in on the left flank of the, the 1st Marine Division. The 1st Marines were in reserve, and we were sent out to, to refuse the flank, to bend the flank back and to protect against the Chinese. There were th literally thousands and thousands of them. My battalion was the f first to go out and the furthest. We were supposed to be uh, married up with uh, the battalion of the 7th Marines are going to come up on our right, and the battalion of the 1st Marines are going to come up on our left. Both of them got stopped by the Chinese behind us. And we were out there by ourselves under an uh, extremely severe attack. We, <coughs> um, we tied in closely for the night. And w while we were in reserve, our, our normal supporting artillery had been di diverted and was up firing for the uh, Korean Marine Corps Regiment. So on the way up, we stopped by and talked to Buzz Weinkoff, uh, the artillery regimental commander, and he said, well, I'll give you the 155s. I'll give you two of them, and then we'll put some more of them on there. 
uh, we brought the 155s. This is a big gun. We brought them in within 50 yards of our position. And one of them had been 50 yards short. We wiped out a platoon, frankly. But uh, it, the fighting was that intense. We were knocked off uh, the, the hill, uh, part of the hill, on a very, very severe attack. We had a hundred casualties, and, and normally, if you've got, you know, you got a th close to a thousand men, a hundred casualties is pretty much routes you out. But then we, then we said, okay, come on back. Well, hell, we were being fired at from behind. There were Chinese between us and them. So I, uh, the battalion commander had fallen, hurt his knee, and he went, I sent the battalion exec, Bill Bridges, and the battalion commander, Rob West. We had some tanks and motor transport. We loaded the wounded into the motor transport and sent the, the tanks along the road with a platoon of, of, of Baker Company to run this gauntlet of machine gun fire the Chinese were bringing in. We, we only had a couple of men killed and, and some more wounded. And some of the wounded wounded again. But they, they made it, and then it was up to us to fight our, our way out. And uh, I devised a plan. We came back by, by echelons. Chinese were pursuing us all the way. Running, running around screaming, surrender, surrender, and Master Fool got his machine guns up. Oh, beautiful job. And that was, that was, that was great. We, uh, <coughs> that was one of the big disappointments. I was recommended for the Navy Cross for that operation. And uh, the Navy Cross was awarded, but it was awarded to the battalion commander who wasn't even there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, that happens, but not very often. I ne never did have any respect for that uh, regimental commander who did that. Well, at any rate, here. Tell me about the ribbons that you have on. Well, these are personal decorations. Okay. Uh, this is a silver star. This is a bronze star with a combat device. This is the air medal. I got the air medal for reconnaissance flights. And, and this is a Navy commendation medal with the combat device. I didn't show this this picture, did I? No. Uh, me in combat gear. And, uh, and my retirement. Well, I sort of skipped over those, but okay. uh, my dad, uh, when I was promoted to colonel, my, my dad pinned me on one shoulder with his Army Eagle, and General Ray Murray put a Marine Corps Eagle on the other shoulder. And from then until I retired, I wore an Army Eagle on one shoulder. And when did you officially retire? Oh, long ago, in 1965. Is there anything else you would like to say to finish up? I, th I think I've said too much already. <laughs> oh, oh I, no, I didn't mention this okay. book. This, uh, this book is uh, a description in detail of the operations of the battalion in the Inchon Landing uh, the Chosen Reservoir Operation and the Spring Operations in 1951, all in Korea. And the original is in? It's, the original of this is in the, uh, the Marine Corps Museum at the Navy uh, Yard in Washington. That's where it was, you know. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming and sharing with us.